Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome to the Alice McKay Room at the Vancouver Public Library. My name is Dylan, and I'm a librarian on the Arts and Culture team here at VPL. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are hosting this event from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. I'm a settler in these lands, which means I have a responsibility to continually learn about the ongoing effects of colonialism where I live and work, and to take sincere actions towards decolonization, especially in my work here at the library. I am so excited to see everybody here on this beautiful sunny spring evening, such a rarity, for this part of the Insight series. We're very grateful to the Vancouver Writers Festival for this partnership, which brings the most engaging writers right here to your library. We've had a great run of this series so far. Raise your hand if you've been here already to one of these. Yes, lots of people, amazing, they love to see it. Um, before I pass things on to Leslie, I just have a couple of housekeeping notes. If you need to exit the room at any time during the event, that's totally fine. Just please use that rear door over there and then come into that rear door. You can go out anytime you want. The washrooms are sort of around the bend right there. We have our brand new fancy water fountain and bottle fill station over there. Ooh, yes, thank you. Which you're welcome to use at any time. I would also encourage you all to silence your phones right now. You don't want to be that person whose phone rings and everybody judges you and hates you for the rest of the night. So this is me looking out for you now. And on that, it's my absolute pleasure to pass the torch to Leslie Hertig of the Vancouver Writers Festival. Okay, it is wonderful to see so many people here on a beautiful Vancouver spring day. Thank you for joining us here at the Vancouver Public Library and hello to everybody watching from home or wherever you may be watching from. We're so glad that you have joined us. We have three incredible writers with us tonight whose books explore love in all its expressions. These works by Christina Cook, and Fleming and Miriam Lacroix were such deliciously engrossing reads and I am so glad to be sharing those with you here tonight. They are for sale right over there. And after this event, you if you buy one, you could get it signed by these three incredible human beings. So do that, do buy the books. Tonight, we are very grateful as ever to the Vancouver Public Library for their collaboration and this space in which we are now gathering. Thank you also to our government sponsors who include the Government of Canada, the BC Arts Council, the City of Vancouver, and CMHC Granville Island. I would also like to thank the publishers who made the visits by these authors possible, so big thanks to them. For those of you who are new to Insight and to the Vancouver Writers Fest, this series runs until the end of May, just about every other Wednesday, although we ha do have an event here next Wednesday. We update our website regularly, so please check that out, or even better, sign up for our newsletter. In just a few moments, I'm going to be welcoming our host tonight, author Candy Tanaka, and they'll chat with Christina, Anne, and Miriam for about an hour before turning it over to you here in the room, as well as those of you at home, to ask some questions of your own. Following the conversation tonight, as I already said, authors will be signing books over here. So now to introduce you to our guests this evening and starting with our host who actually happens to work here at the Vancouver Public Library but is also an acclaimed writer in their own right. Candy Tanaka is a trans writer challenging the binaries continually reconstructed between self and other in literary fiction. Their work explores archive and memory in a futuristic context. They are in the final revision stages of a first novel and working on a second manuscript, as well as penning a suite of poems about working on the waterfront. They have published work with Anvil Press, Guernica Editions, and Orca Book Publishers, and their latest YA novel is called Baby Drag Queen and was released in April of 2023. And our authors this evening. Christina Cook's debut novel, Brought Up Sea, was published this winter by House of Anansi Press. It has been named a must-read title by over 19 publications such as CBC Books, Elle, and Cosmopolitan UK, just to name a few. Acclaimed writer Kinesia Lubrin had this to say of Brought Up Sea. 
It is the work of a writer of immense heart. Cook's sharp imagination grows the more you read this novel, which by turns brims with careful, sensitive storytelling. This debut promises, delivers, and delights. That's great praise. And I must say for all three of these authors tonight, when I saw the quotes on the books, I think, oh my goodness, these quotes. This is, I'm telling you, these guys are the real thing. Um, a Journey Prize winner and McDowell, McDowell Fellow, Christina Cook holds a Master of Arts from the University of New Brunswick and a Master of Fine Arts from the Iowa Writers' Workshop. Her writing also has appeared in multiple publications. Born in Jamaica, Christina now lives, is now a Canadian citizen who lives and writes in New York City. Our next author is Miriam Lacroix. She was born in Montreal to a Quebecois mother and Moroccan father and currently lives in Vancouver. She has a BFA in creative writing from the University of British Columbia and an MFA from Syracuse University where she was editor in chief of Salt Hill Journal and received the New York Public Humanities Fellowship for creating Outfront, an LGBTQ plus writing group whose goal was to expand the possibilities of queer writing. How It Works Out is her first book, and here is what George Saunders had to say about her new book. What an audacious, breathtaking, and inspiring debut. The power of this formerly innovative and deeply funny book is that everything exists to serve the compassionate heart at its core. Miriam Lacroix's work is a cause for celebration. And finally, Anne Fleming has just re released Curiosities, and it is already getting rave reviews. Author Anne-Marie MacDonald had this to say, Curiosities is pure delight. Anne Fleming draws us in so that we feel we are living in the characters' lives, whether braving the North Atlantic on a sailing ship or stealing away for a forbidden tryst in the English countryside. And she does it all with a light touch that has the reader dancing through peril and pleasure. I agree, really. My goodness, these quotes. Well done. Anne is also the author of the much praised novel Anomaly. Her first book, Pool Hopping and Other Stories, was shortlisted for the Governor General's Literary Award for Fiction, the Ethel Wilson Prize, and the Danita Gleed Award. She is also the author of a middle grade novel, The Goat, which was named one of the top 10 children's books of the year by the New York Public Library and the Wall Street Journal. Her new novel, Curiosities, is for sale over here. So please welcome all of our guests here tonight. Come on up to the stage. Good, all good. Okay, so, um, well, I'm just really happy that we're going to have lots of fun tonight uh, with three brilliant writers because, you know, really there's so much going on in the world right now um, and everything's feeling a little heavy for sure. So, again, first thing to note, uh, Miriam, Anne, and Christina will be taking questions from both the in-person audience and the online audience tonight. So please remember to keep your questions a question and respectful and kind. Uh, we're going to have about 20 minutes at the end of the evening, and I know that everyone is excited about having them all here tonight with us. And as um, Leslie has mentioned already, Gina from Black Bond Books, Book Warehouse is over there selling books, so as um, you know, a sign of respect, you know, please buy these authors' books, and they're going to be signing them, and you can probably have a little chat with them afterwards, which is also a little bonus. Uh, so, because we only have an hour and a little bit of time, we're just going to get right into it. So, Christina, welcome. Um, now, did you actually drive here from New York? Was that right? <laughs> no. Okay. I definitely flew. Okay. Definitely <laughs> and how flew. was your how was your trip? Um, surprisingly uneventful. Oh. I was fully bracing for something to go wrong at JFK because that's just the norm, and nothing happened. Wow. Okay. How boring. Bonus. And Anne, I was, I was thinking you were coming from the Okanagan, but you're telling me now that you're actually here from Victoria, and your ferry ride was... Uh, it was uh, actually weirdly quiet. 
<laughs> and it was, oh, there were tons of seats on the ferry. There's never seats on the ferry. And there was, yeah, it was, it was very smooth sailing. Okay, Miriam, you're going to have to save the day. Well, Do you have a story? Well How was your bus ride over? Did you yeah. walk? I what did you do? Did you lift like I did? I had a grueling voyage from East Vancouver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, now I know this is a common question, but uh, for people that haven't been able to get a hold of your books yet, because, you know, Christina, your book was just published in January, so still relatively new. People might have, might have it, but they might not have finished it if you're a slow reader like me. Um, and, uh, and your book just came out on April the 9th, so really, really recent. And Miriam, where is your book? No, I'm just kidding. Your book, your book is over there, and it's coming out. It's going to be published on May the 7th, you said, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So let's start with Christina then. Uh, do you want to give a short summary of your book? Sure. So this is my debut novel, Brought Up See. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Oh, I haven't even done anything yet. Oh, this is the best crowd. Um, uh, thank you all for being here. Um, this book has been uh, many years in the making, and so I really relish the opportunity to celebrate it with these other wonderful, lovely authors and with all, and with all of you. Um, Brotopsy is essentially a queer sibling story um, told from the first, first person following 20-year-old Akua, whose younger brother has just died. Um, she uses that as an occasion to reconnect with her estranged older sister, Tamika. So she flies from Canada um, back to Jamaica um, with her brother's ashes in tow. Um, as you can imagine, the trip um, kind of delves very deeply into you know, issues of grief, of family, of belonging, and of kind of like trying to reconcile her queerness with her kind of like Jamaicanness. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I won't give too much more away. <laughs> okay, let's just move along the line here, Anne. Um, Curiosities is um, uh, told, well, sort of there's a frame narrative where there's a kind of a hapless amateur historian named Anne Fleming <laughs> who, who um, somehow amazingly found these five different manuscripts from the 17th century that are all connected. How could this be? Um, so uh, yeah, so there are these um, five different manuscripts and uh, several different point of view characters. And then there's the Anne narrator who, who jumps in from time to time to comment on the action. Miriam? Um, yeah, I found it interesting that I also have a, a Miriam as the main <laughs> character of my book. <laughs> I, you did not send me the memo. Like, how did, how did I? <laughs> and Anne actually used to be my teacher when I was younger, so maybe there was some, like, influence there. <laughs> um, which actually, now I can think of the exact story, but I'll talk to you about it later. Um, so right, my book is How It Works Out. Uh, it's a relationship multiverse in which each chapter offers an alternate outcome to the relationship between Miriam and Allison, a queer couple. Uh, so the chapters begin with sort of dreamy, surreal, idealistic, early love uh, kind of scenarios. And then as the book progresses, we get to know the characters more. Uh, the relationship gets complicated and the alternate outcomes get a little bit less rose-tinted. Okay, great. Those were great summaries. Um, now, let's go to the readings. Now, I know you all wanted to do a reading tonight, mm -hmm. so we are going to start with Anne this time. Anne, uh, they're going to do readings for about five minutes. Uh, Anne's going to do one that's a little bit longer because Anne has a very specific piece that is really all about love, right, Anne, which is the title of this event tonight. Yes, I, I chose something that was all about love. Well, yeah. Um, I actually have two little extra. Is it okay if I go to the podium? Is that yeah, I think work? the podium mic is, is on. Is that work, yeah. everybody? Sure, whatever yeah. you'd like. That yeah. would be easier than. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the... we. Yeah. Okay. We can maybe get you a mic stand. Or... Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's. Uh, I can hear myself. You can hear me. Okay, okay yeah. fantastic. Um, so. Um, 
I just uh, want to say thanks so much, everyone, for being here. Um, thanks to the Writers' Festival. I also really want to thank um, uh, to the people in my in the audience um, read this book uh, were readers for me and really helped me see where I was getting stuck. Um, my friend Mark Scott and my friend Leslie Walker Williams um, they're here and also my, my partner and adult son are here and they've um, been with me for this whole journey of writing the book and I just want to say thanks to them and thanks to um, other friends who are um, amazing supports so. Um, thanks so much. Okay, so I'm going to read from this little bit uh, where um, the, one of the manuscripts is the memoir of Lady Margaret Long. And um, so a uh, little teeny bit here from this. Um, so this is in the language of the 17th century, but I'm not going to do a fake British accent. <laughs> it fell out that while my nieces and their schoolroom companion were deletescent with me, my maid ran off with a nonconformist. I pressed my nieces, would they consent to have Joan, for that was the maid's name, leave their employment for mine? After some persuasion and discussion with my sister, I prevailed, and Joan came to live with me. As with my nieces, she was ever more companion than maidservant. I strongly suspect her parentage is not what she thinks, as I have told her often again. Another year brought greater sorrow. On Christmas Day, my husband died at table. One moment he was discoursing of poesy, the next his face dropped into his soup. He had a great fervor that soup come hot to table. I feared he would burn himself. The dish made a terrible noise. Broughton, a physician who dined with us, leapt to his side, eye pulling his face from the soup, Broughton clapping a hand to his neck to find a pulse where was none to find. He was gone. Now were my heart and soul plunged into darkest night. After we put him in the ground, I sent away my husband's friends and refused all company. When my sorrow had something waned, I wandered the halls of Longwood, cold and empty where once they had been full of music and wit and was rent anew. I had not even the will to attend church. The rector called on me and tried to turn my head toward life. I sent him off as soon as I was able. Uh, Joan was my main, my only companion. She had in her infancy lost in the sickness all she loved and understood my grief. She never asked that I again grow merry as had been my wont. She read to me. She visited my husband's grave with me and the graves of our children. Spring came. The steward had need of me. I referred him to Joan. The gardener had need of me. I referred him to Joan. I felt a lassitude in my very bones. Summer came. With the change in weather came a change in me. The lassitude lessened, evaporated, and was gone. When Joan said, I wonder if the owls nest again in the wood, I said, well, let us ascertain the truth of the matter. She did not so much as raise her eyebrows, though any other soul would have. I rose and dressed and ventured out of doors, felt the sun and the wind and the shade, smelt the grass and the trees and the flowers, and felt wonder creep back into my heart. When I am in extremis, I let my mind loose upon the page. Why? Why do I put this down, that I was born, that I was educated, that I was married, that I was happy that my children died, that I was widowed, that I was full of grief? Because by my side stood Joan. The love I bore for Joan, and, I will say it, my curiosity about the world, carried me through more than God himself, unless Joan's love came to me by God's grace, which I must not doubt. In truth, I doubted God's existence. I still do, but I am flawed and irrational as any other. I write this because Joan, who is not a witch, but has been called one, must be exonerated. Um, and I'm skipping ahead to another scene here. So this is later on. Um, uh, Joan, we first meet Joan as a young child of about six years of age. Um, when she and Tom um, were uh, plague um, decimated their small town in um, southern England. Uh, and um, 
basically like they're the only people left alive in the village for a little chunk of time and then people start arriving again. Um, but they're, then the two of them are separated and they come back together again. Tom was born Thomasina but has lived as Tom from about age nine or ten. And um, so he's arriving um, delivering eggs to Lady Margaret and uh, um, he doesn't know that, that uh, who's going to be there. I carried with me the chest lined with wool that had within it two smaller chests also lined with wool. I went to open them, but Lady Margaret, in her eagerness, held out her hands, took the larger box and laid it on the table, slipped the latch, lifted the lid, pulled away the wool, and there lay the ostrich egg of a size to fill a man's hand. She lifted it delicately out and held it before her in wonder. She turned to the eggs and birds she had. I have measured, Mr. Barrows, she said, the size of an egg relative to the bird, and it is not always the same, but it is in the range of one-tenth. If you take the length of an egg and add its width and divide by two, very often it turns out to be one-tenth the length of the bird. Joan, get the measuring stick. I had met so many Jones in this world that I no longer started each time I heard the name. A hundred disappointments led me to take less notice. And yet, I turned my eyes on Lady Margaret's companion for the first time to reassure myself that once again, I would be disappointed. We were far from Wormsill, far from, far from Kent, where if she lived, she surely lived still. The light in the room was dimmer than in the drawing room, and she was turned away to take up the measuring stick, but in her movements and gestures was something familiar, and when she turned back, I saw the shape of her face was something like the shape of Joan's face. Lady Margaret laid the egg atop a sheet of paper on the table. Joan carefully traced its shape upon the paper, then Lady Margaret set the egg back in its wool. Now Lady Margaret measured the length and breadth of the outline. Her head and Joan's bent over the paper. The length is, said Lady Margaret, six inches, said Joan. Was that her voice? My eyes remained fixed on this Joan. And the breadth is a little over five. Lady Margaret raised her head. If this be one-tenth the bird, then the bird is 55 inches, almost my height. She beheld the egg in renewed wonder. A bird the size of you, Joan laughed. I cannot imagine it. Now she must have melt, felt my eyes upon her, for she turned and looked at me directly, and in her eyes, large and blue, in her cheekbones, in her small chin, the truth of herself was there. Twas my Joan indeed. Joan, I breathed, not knowing I did it. Know you my maid, Mr. Barrows? Maid, said I. Joan looked at me curiously now to see if she should know me. I wished her to know me without being told. I wished to weep and throw myself upon her. I closed my hand to make it into a fist to strike my myself upon the breast, her name in the language of old nut. But before I did so, recognition came across her face. Tom, she said. She put her hand to her mouth with a great intake of breath that she held and held until at last she exhaled and wept. Tears ran freely down my face. Okay, great. Thank you, Anne. So I'm going to ask each of the writers a question uh, after their reading. But Anne, I just wanted to say, you know, you and I go way back, right? Do you remember? Um, so Anne was a creative writing instructor, believe it or not, at Emily Carr when I was there. And she probably won't remember this, but I wrote my first and most likely my only sonnet ever in that class. Uh, I have it right here. I'm going to read it tonight. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to read it. Um, but, uh, you know, and I think... Don't tease us. <laughs> Christina, you would not enjoy it, I have to say. It was very early on writing. Although Anne probably gave me an okay grade because she's just a very kind person. Um, has anyone else here had a class with Anne? Because Miriam has also had a class with Anne. Okay, well, just, just Miriam and I. So for Christina, you haven't had a class with Anne yet? I need okay. to. Yeah. Clearly, I'm not in the club. Um, so now, let's see. Uh, I really love the use of your language in your book, Anne. Uh, the bizarre situations that the characters got into, uh, you know, especially Old Nut. 
Old Net is a favorite of mine, I have to say, so when you get a chance to read the book, um, you'll, you'll probably understand why. But Anne, I wanted to ask you about John Aubrey. So there's someone that you reference in your book, and I actually wasn't too sure if he was a real person or not, of course, but I should know this because, um, you know, being a writer as well, uh, John Aubrey is actually the father of the English biography form. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And on that note, um, just a little thing that, you know, for John Aubrey, on his travels through southern England, he collected uh, notes on nature, scientific phenomenon, architecture, inscriptions, stories, and anecdotes. He also collected books and manuscripts, paintings. Um, but he didn't know what he was going to do with them at the time when he collected them. But he was a very a scrupulous modern-day journalist, I heard. So tell us the connections between your manuscript and his writings and teachings, and do they mirror yours in a way? Oh, my goodness. Um, okay, that's a lot packed into one question. But, <laughs> that's a um, question. No, Anne, you can do uh, it. <laughs> um, John Aubrey, uh, uh, I first encountered him um, because uh, I was researching the 17th century, and... Um, he was mentioned everywhere. Like everybody got their information about other people from John Aubrey. I'm like, okay, I better look up John Aubrey. And he has this book called Brief Lives, um, which he never intended to be a book, um, but is about the lives of different um, people who went to Oxford, men who went to Oxford. There's a few women in the book too, but, um, and they're so funny. They're so frank and so, um, I was really not expecting that at all. So like, there's one that I actually quote in the book where, He's talking about this uh, man who was a judge and he was well known for hanging highwaymen. Um, and the highwaymen wanted to get back at him for hanging them, as you do. And, um, <laughs> and so they captured him one day near Tyburn, which is where like the gallows were, right? And so they tied him up to the gallows and he was on his horse and then, then, then they took off and they tied his hands behind his back and he had to like calm his horse and to not go anywhere until uh, somebody came and rescued him. And then it goes on, so this is a story that Aubrey tells, and then he says, and later he was walking down, I don't know, Cheapside, and uh, he was overcome by a sudden looseness. <laughs> and he turned up his breeches in front of the curtain. And so like he, he's, he's has diarrhea on the street. And this, that's the looseness. Yeah, he was overcome with looseness. That's what looseness is. And um, so this is the kind of stuff that is in Aubrey. I'm like, it's not stuffy at all. It's very um, raw and earthy and funny and to the point. And so, I mean, and he has, a, uh, he collects these like uh, folk beliefs. So one of my favorites was, um, if you want to cure thrush in um, a child, um, uh, get a live frog, put it in the <laughs> child's mouth, and keep it there until the frog dies. Oh, oh. There you go. Oh, wow. I'm wow. going to try it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, um, so Aubrey was completely, completely charming. At a certain point, I, I kind of actually wanted to write the whole book in his voice and to make it be this story of the 17th century it would start in 1603 with the plague and it would end in, he wasn't born until 1626, but it would end in 1697 and there was like this symmetry, 1903, 1697, or 1603, um, 1697, three years. Anyway, um, but it just didn't work out uh, <laughs> and, and I just snuck him in sideways. Okay. Next book. Maybe next book. Yeah, maybe. The next book. Kids book. Kids book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So next up, we're going to have Christina do a reading. And you're welcome to use the podium if you want. Or I'm going to okay. stay seated because sure. the podium will point out how short I am. So <laughs> if I stay here, everyone will think that I am much more, much taller than I am. Um, so I love this theme of being all about love. Um, I haven't yet gotten a chance to read um, Anne or, Mi or Miriam's books because I stupidly live in the US, so would not recommend it. Um, and the only way to get it is through Amazon, which I refuse, but I very much look forward to learning more and diving in. Um, and so when thinking about my own novel, Brautopsy, which deals with many types of love. It deals with familial love, it deals with cultural love, it deals with you know, sexual love, both romantic and not. 
Um, it was kind of hard to narrow it down, but I think I'm going to read today from um, the, this, the kind of crux of the sibling love um, and, and the complications that it unfolds. So to kind of set you up, um, as I mentioned in my introduction, um, the younger brother, Bryson, dies. Um, the novel opens with his death. Um, so I'm going to read now from a section where they're in the hospital trying to do everything that they can to save the youngest member of their family. It's a long shot, the doctor says, rubbing his chin and handing over the forms, but we're running out of options. The illness is progressing quickly. It's worth taking a look. Daddy nods, signing the forms, th then handing them to me. He doesn't read them, doesn't need to read them. He's been signing forms and sending Bryson and me for tests in, ho in hospitals since I was 10. The tests should have caught this. I flip through the pages and pages of fine print trying to take it all in. Just sign, Daddy says, sounding tired. Through the shut door, I can hear Bryson coughing fever getting worse. Are you all of Bryson's next of kin, the doctor says? If there are other family members, it'd be ideal if we could test them too. I can't come, my older sister Tamika had said. She could and she should, but she won't. Because why? Because 10 years ago, my father packed up, packed up my family and flew us over the sea. My sister and brother and me, daddy flew us first to Texas before finally making home here, in Vancouver. I was 10 when we first left. Bryson was two and Tamika was 16. In my head, Tamika's still 16. Soon after we moved, Tamika left us abroad and went back home. All I know, is that years passed with her in Kingston and us in Texas, then Canada, and daddy calling her on the phone yelling. Back then, he was always yelling, calling her and want Edie a child for leaving. What about mommy, Tamika would sometimes say. Who is here to tend to her? Every time, the line would fall into hard silence just heavy sighs echoing until someone hung up. Our mother is dead, so Tamika stayed behind, shaking her head in a never-ending no. But now our brother is dying, and there's me wanting my big sister. What a idiot child. Signing the form, I press the pen against the paper so hard that it starts to rip. Our sister is in Kingston, delayed by a plane that will never land. Now I'm going to skip forward a tiny bit. Um, her brother passes. She is filled with conviction to reconnect with her, with her older sister. Um, and so she makes the trek. She makes the trek back to Jamaica, first time that she's been on the island in 10 years. Um, so now her and Tamika are in the car leaving the airport. Why didn't you come, I asked Tamika. She kisses the lacquered grain of Bryson's urn in a gentle hello. His funeral, I say a little louder. The hospital, all of it. Why didn't you come? Pursing her lips, Tamika's as quiet now as she was when we first left when daddy made all his plans for our first departure. He said we needed a new start, that it is what our mother wanted. Tamika asked him if he crawled into her grave and asked her himself. When daddy came home with our US visas, Tamika barricaded herself in her bedroom. She was going to start sixth form right here at home, like her and mommy had planned. Why, Daddy yelled, threatening to break down the door. Tamika wouldn't answer. All she did was slide her sc 
scholarship letter under her door day after day, the seal on the top waxy and bright. Hampton School for Girls. Our mother went to Hampton, so she was going too, and that was that. After a while, my father gave, gave up banging and emptied the house around her, trying to smoke her out with silence. Tamika sucked the smoke in and turned it back on us all. For 10 years, all I knew of my sister was her voice through the phone. I thought our brother dying would be enough to bridge this distance I didn't understand. Why didn't you come, I ask again. Why didn't you come, she murmurs. All this time since you leave your father house and you never come look for me. I stare at her, head spinning as I open and shut my mouth like a gutted fish as we continue down the road with the press and pause of traffic. We are sisters, not friends. Our shared blood means there is nothing here to earn, to covet, to lose. We will remain sisters no matter what happens, no matter what we do or don't say or how many years we're apart. I want to scream in her face, but instead I clamp my lips against all my angry questions. You wanted me to come to you, but you left us. And for what? I chew the inside of my cheek. Tamika keeps driving, sighing with the relief of knowing I'm due no answers. My sister did not come to my brother's funeral. That's that. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. And it's funny that you read that part because my question to you, or, well, before I get to the question, I just want to tell you that I was really happy actually to see your book out in a small library in the Fraser Valley on display. I was like, what? That's like awesome. And so my um, little heart can't handle it. <laughs> especially too when it's a small library like mm -hmm. kind of way out in the burbs and I'm just like okay awesome um, but I've never you know I've never been to Jamaica uh, but with your novel I love that I, I felt like I was there you know in a way I could see the colors I could feel the heat I could smell the food and uh, at the same time I could sense the sort of different types of tension that Akua must have been feeling uh, your sentences are so descriptive I love the dialogue as well and how the text would have a smattering of patois in it it was very lovely mm -hmm. so Christina I read somewhere that you have three sisters and that you are the youngest and that you don't have a brother yeah. so how was it to write about the brotherly love that Akua felt uh, for Bryson uh, which is one of the basic uh, one of the basic threads throughout the book mm -hmm. and you know it's centered on happy memories grief and anger that Akua felt as you mentioned towards Tamika mm -hmm. uh, for not coming to the funeral um, there's a sort of nuanced situation too where Akua felt like she had to explain to Bryson when she was buying a wallet that she wasn't a man mm -hmm. um, so how did it feel sort of to to write those two contrasts in the types of love yeah I think um, so I have two older sisters, so there's three of us total, um, and I'm really fascinated by the idea of sibling order, because I think that it really shapes and gives um, depth to our wants, our perspectives, just the ways that we move through the world in ways that are not easily apparent. You know, it's kind of like the undercurrent below the crust of, of um, each of our Earths, if you will. And so I, 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 I'm obsessed with it. Um, and I wanted to find a way to explore it through, f through fiction. Because there's a way in which it, it really can, you know, each person in the family has a totally different experience of that family. And then what does that mean, right? When you kind of like face each other and we're sisters, we are supposed to be one, we are supposed to be aligned, but yet my understanding of our family and yours could not be more different. Um, and so that kind of proved to be a very fertile ground um, and, and is kind of the central um, exceeding ground for the novel and gave me the perfect um, 
uh, in, if you will, that I needed to explore the ideas of homecoming and grief and belonging and family and being rooted. Because um, there's so much of that, you know, of in like a cultural context, the idea of belonging that um, exploring it through family makes it very tangible. You know, it makes it all external. It makes it so that you can see it. Um, and so I think it's no coincidence that within my novel, so many of the tensions, right, between Akua, who has left Jamaica, and between her sister, Tamika, who remained in Jamaica, you know, that they have such an uneasiness in trying to find a sense of peace and belonging kind of mirrors the same tension of being a Jamaican of the mind versus a Jamaican of the land. Um, and so it was a way that I could get at all those different levels in a way that kind of opened up the conversation. And for people who don't have siblings or who are not Jamaican or, or who have never had to reconcile who they are you know, as being separate from where they live, you know, it kind of gave an easy and expansive invitation. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Miriam, you're up next. Hi. Um, I think I'm going to do the podium thing. Maybe. Sure. Yeah. It's just me. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Perfect height. There you go. Sorry, Christina. <laughs> I'm there with you, Christina, so don't worry. Just kidding. <laughs> um, oh, I lost my page. Give me, give me a second. All right. Well, first of all, those were such beautiful, stunning readings, and thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think I had a feeling that there would be a lot of deep reflections on love, so I'm here to put a damper on that, <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to read from uh, the middle part of my book. So, reminder, each chapter is sort of an alternate reality um, and an alternate outcome to this relationship between Miriam and Allison. So, in the more recent chapters, things have been getting, um, have been sort of souring in the relationship, and yet they persist in being together. Um, in this chapter, they, well, you'll see. <laughs> The sequel. I do, I say, but I can't focus on the words. I'm distracted by the El Canada photographer. Oh, I should have said, sorry, I shouldn't do this, but <laughs> this is from the perspective of Allison. It kind of switches perspectives. Okay. I do, I say, but I can't focus on the words. I'm distracted by the El Canada photographer whose finger is going at the shutter button like she's trying to get it off. Steve is typing like crazy on his phone, live tweeting. He's our agent, Steve, mine and Miriam's. Ten years ago, he helped us sell our book, How It Works Out, building a healthy lesbian relationship in the patriarchy. <laughs> Without him, Miriam would still be making lattes for yogis and designer Gore-Tex and I'd still be answering phone calls from sweaty people with broken air conditioners. We helicoptered out of Vancouver early this morning and were dropped off in the snow-sticky slopes of Banff. We could have driven, but Miriam insisted that being helicoptered to her wedding has always been her dream. She's always making up these dreams. And you wonder where our money goes, I said, as the pilot lugged Miriam's six large suitcases and my small carry-on into the penthouse of the Fairmont Hotel. After that, we stopped by the local radio station for a pre-wedding interview. Miriam and Allison tying the knot, who would have thought we'd see the day, said the CKXI host, John McFarland. In the last chapter of your book, 
you warn readers that even lesbians who succeed at marriage ultimately fail, for they have succeeded only in infiltrating an institution that hates them. What changed, guys? <laughs> Thanks for bringing this up, John, Miriam said. This was actually one of our biggest fears when we decided to do this, that our readers would feel like we misled them. But John, we wrote how it works out over 10 years ago. Our views have evolved, it's only healthy. You can only try to beat the system for so long, I picked up, before you decide to work it to your advantage. Besides, don't I have the most beautiful bride? There you have it, folks, true love. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by today, ladies. Now, in your honor, we're going to play a little Tegan and Sarah track called Boyfriend from the album Love You to Death. Is it true they'll be at the wedding? They better be, Miriam laughed. You hear that, TNS? Be there or be square, the host laughed. Now I'm in some chateau, kissing Miriam, slipping in some tongue for the press. I pick her up and jog her down the aisle, smiling to show off my crooked canine, which some internet forums agree is my best attribute. In the second pew, I notice Tegan tracing her bicep tattoos with her forefinger, while Sarah stares at the back of my dad's head with disgust. <laughs> Miriam squeals, tucking her nose into my bow-tied neck. I'm not sure when to put her down, so I carry her all the way to our suite, feeling my lower back scream. Oh my god, Kristen Stewart retweeted one of our wedding pics, Miriam yells, <laughs> even though I can hear her perfectly because she's peeing with the door open. She knows I hate this, but she won't be robbed of the pleasure she gets from exposing her bodily functions to me. <laughs> I look at my phone and see the Kristen retweet. Hashtag MA wedding is trending, so is hashtag how it works out. I see a text from Steve that says, it's in the bag. Steve has been trying to get publishers interested in a sequel to How It Works Out. When it first came out, How It Works Out was on every queer woman's shelf, but lately sales have dropped to almost nothing. The new generation doesn't find us radical, radical enough. Nobody cares if a couple of Canadian lesbians have a happy ending. So Steve had an idea. If we can't win over the queer feminists, we might have a chance with the right-wing lesbians, the gated community dykes. <laughs> They're the ones with the disposable income anyway. The first step was to get married, get the media's attention, show publishers the names Miriam and Allison still mean something. It's all gonna work out, baby, Miriam says. She plops onto the bed, and I notice she's not wearing any underwear under her slip. I avert my eyes. I need to go down to the hotel store, I say. I need stuff for the honeymoon. I don't need to look. I know she's wearing the expression that says, you are so uptight, you ruin everything. Don't you think I look nice, she says. Of course, I say remembering the way she looked when we were young and I loved her enough to write a book about our love. Sort of pretty, in a tired way. She puts on her, her dress for the reception, a pink tulle puff with too much breast padding, and I'm confronted with the way she looks now, like a performance of herself. Thank you so much, Miriam. So, um, you know, I loved your book in that it took me on this sort of like fascinating, frantic trip where I actually had to take a break between your stories. Um, as a reader, you had a, <laughs> no, this is good, this is good. You had, a, as a reader, you had a switching between the different points of view, as you mentioned, between Miriam and Allison, and I wasn't sure at times if there were bits of Miriam in Allison and vice versa. Um, and then there's this really tender, intense vulnerability in the love that you write about between them both. 
Uh, so there is this bit, which I'm quoting from your book, where Allison says, I think, wow, what an authentic moment. But then I feel guilty, because what does authentic even mean? Is it just a weird, ignorant impulse to uh, exoticize some people's normal lives? And what does it mean that nothing in my own life ever feels authentic? So does anything feel authentic to this Miriam that's on stage right now, tonight? Do you think it's hard as a writer to have a so-called normal life? And did you take some time out when you were writing your book to figure out how to intertwine your stories? Can you repeat the part about authenticity? Like, do I feel Yeah, I'm just, as, you know, because you're the Miriam in the book. There's mm -hmm. Miriam on the stage here. Yeah. Is there anything that you feel, like, does, does anything feel authentic to you? Like, ab about the... Just... Well, okay. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll pick up on what you said about maybe the way that I write Miriam from the Allison perspective. Okay, sure, yeah. Yeah, which, um, yeah, I think the Miriam in the book is very inauthentic in some ways because she's written from the perspective of Allison. Um, yeah, and I, I think those, those chapters, like the one that I just read from the from the Allison perspective, they were just they were just so fun for me to write <laughs> because I got to play with my own self perception so much, you know. Um, yeah, yeah I, I got to. Sorry, I feel like I'm... <laughs> no, you know what, I think you're doing great. I, I would like to say this is Miriam's first official sort of oh, like yeah. on-stage, you know, <laughs> kind of appearance. So let's give her a big hand for that. And I mean, um, really, Miriam, too, I mean, exactly like what you were saying. It's like, I just, you know, I think that um, there were parts, it seemed like at times there were parts where I was like, okay, is this, I was getting confused. I'm like, wh who's Miriam? Which one's Miriam? You know, um, is it the Miriam that, that, you know, as the writer, or is it this other Miriam? Like, how constructed is Miriam? Is there little parts of Miriam actually in the story that are actually you? Does that make any sense? Yeah, okay, so I do think that it was sort of an attempt at getting to the real Miriam, and um, I think that to do that, I had to go through all the perceptions that I have about myself and all of the ways that I think other people perceive myself, perceive me and the ways that I felt perceived in this relationship, which is such a big, it was my first uh, big relationship as a queer person. Um, and yeah, so I think I need it af afterwards. And it, w it was a difficult relationship, if I'm honest. It brought up a lot of questions. Uh, that I that I had about myself, and I, in order, I'm saying myself a lot, sorry. <laughs> um, but I think that in order to find myself after that relationship, I needed to go through all these different Miriams and all the ways in which Miriam can be so awful, and all the ways in which she just ruins things, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, ironically, I think that after doing all of that. I had to, I took kind of a, a swerve at the end of the book, so I wrote this, um, the final chapter in the perspective of an actress who's playing the role of Miriam, and that was, that character exploration I think was the most honest and authentic that I was able to be, I think, um, yeah, what, when you're writing someone with your own name, and maybe you know this, and I think it's, again, it's such fun to like make fun of yourself, because you, you can never be as mean to any other character as you can <laughs> to a character who's named after you, you know? <laughs> it wouldn't be professional. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think I needed, I sort of needed another character to, understand Miriam and I needed to have, you know, as this actress at the end of the book is working through the character, she's understanding so much about her own personal story and 
um, I think that I was, I was able to be nice and kind to that character and to see her truth. And so we, we did get to an authentic Miriam, but there were like a lot of jokes at my expense in the meantime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that because it was just so real. I just, anyways, I think it, I think it was <laughs> great. Um, so we are, of course, we're getting close, you know, to the end of time. But I did want to do some rapid fire questions before we get to the audience questions. So usually, what I do is I just say, "Hey, these quick questions." So just quickly, we'll go down the row like this. Okay. So celebrity crush right now. <laughs> Megan The Stallion. I don't know any celebrities. <laughs> You're supposed to you, say me. Say <laughs> Christina Cook. There we go. Oh. Chris Fleming. Okay. Describe your ideal or dream writing environment in three words. Snacks. Nighttime. Cozy. Mm. All right. I like that. I got, can I steal that? Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, snacks, nighttime, and cozy. <laughs> Alone, Twinkle Lights, EDM. Oh. <laughs> EDM! <laughs> Let's talk later. Okay, type of love that you think goes most unnoticed? Um, platonic love, like your best friend love. Um, love in the animal world. Maybe love for future generations. Great. Okay, favorite uh, board game, video game, or TV series game, if you have one. TV series game? Well, you know, reality TV game shows. Oh, <laughs> I don't do any of those things. Okay, you can say pass. Uh, no pass. board games, no nothing? Okay. No, I'm having my snacks. Video game? Um, I... I really loved um, Password, and um, <laughs> when and and there was a box of like a home version of Password, and um, I really really loved playing that with my friends. And we worked out this whole system where you know you're only supposed to give one word clues, and then you're supposed to get the answer. And so we would, would always do like head movements, like um, uh, let me see what's an example, like under. And they're supposed to say ground, or you know, um, that sort of thing. So we had this whole like, and and that was our. Um, we love password. Um, I like to play Quirkle with my mummy. Oh, that's yeah. cute. <laughs> okay, last one. Now, do you return your library books on time or not? Be honest. I, 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 I'm, because I'm a writer, I'm, I'm a big, like, support other writers, and so I buy books, also because I write in them, so I just, I buy okay, that's, all my that's books, but answer. I have a library card, okay. but, I, but I buy books. <laughs> um, I um, used to always return them late when there were fines, and then as soon as the amnesty happened, <laughs> I'm like, I bring them in on, on time now. <laughs> Yeah, I feared taking them out before the amnesty thing, so that has really helped me, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, good to know. Now, I'm sure the audience has lots of questions. I don't have any uh, from the online uh, watchers right now, but are there anybody, is there anybody in the audience right now that has a question? You can shout and then I'll try and repeat it, but remember, my memory's very, very small. Okay, so what would you say for each of your books is the ideal mindset to go in with it? We'll just go whoever's ready. I think for my book, because so much of the magic of it is not, like this isn't really a book where you go into it being like, who done it? You know, it's, it's, it's not a book where the, the plot is not the point. It's the experience of kind of like encountering 
the richness of this, um, of this young woman's experiences. And so I think um, when you're in the mood for just some immaculate vibes, <laughs> I think that is the best mindset <laughs> to approach my we book. We should just get Christina to answer first, and then every question. Are you going to steal and that then question? We just steal can I? Can I? Okay, okay. Are okay. you ready? Okay. Steal her answer, <laughs> and then pass it along, right? Because <laughs> I have no idea. Well, like, I, like I, I have an writing I have it. An you're, okay, what is it? What? Okay, so I think if you're, if you want to do like really fun exploration, you know, where um, it'll be like just ridiculous rubs up against the profound, I okay. think that is the mindset. Yeah, you're right. Okay, you are really good. It's true, that's one of my favorite things uh, always is, um, you know, the laugh and the sucker punch. The, you know, the laugh and the kick in the gut, it's like, oh, that's my, my favorite thing of all. Wow, Christina sees us. Um, <laughs> I think for my book, I would say, kind of don't have any expectations, if that makes sense. I, not that you shouldn't expect to enjoy it, but <laughs> um, I think the form of the book is a bit uh, unusual. And if you go in expecting like, a regular novel or yeah, I think I think yeah just be open to what it is and also maybe be prepared to laugh at tragedy yeah okay is there anybody else that has a question okay so is there a part of the writing process that you wish was talked about more uh, I'll just answer that one. Just ask me how many times I wrote one sentence, you know, like, let's really break it down. <laughs> Why did I put that comma there? I mean, I know we, we really shouldn't talk about those things because they're boring, but it's really like 95% of it. <laughs> what do you guys think? I, actually, I'm, I'm asking myself, what is talked about a lot? What do you think is talked about a lot? <laughs> and. Um, do you, do you have an answer for what is talked about a lot? I think there's a lot about like, plot, character development, and you know, you get to know the viewer, the right. readers, and like, the sort of like practical part of it. Yeah. Uh, there's a little bit about like, what was the home for it, but I uh, I, I don't know. I think a lot, of, almost everything is talked about a lot somewhere <laughs> in the world. And um, uh, the, um, I had something and now it's gone. So um, if you had an answer, I'll jump in later. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, I think the thing that's not talked about enough, I have a three part response. Um, first, structure. You know, it's, it, it's the thing that when you encounter a book, you should never see it or feel it or know that it's there, but it is absolutely crucial to um, the reader feeling held and feeling, a sh and feeling like they have sure footing as they are kind of tumbling through your world. I think structure is not talked about enough. Um, two, revision and how your book is supposed to change through revision. If all, if, if like all you're doing in revision is moving commas around, something is wrong, boo. Like it's just revision. That's not what I said. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the final thing that I think that I'll say is just like how incredibly unique, you know, the path is from ideation to fruition for each individual writer, you know? The things that, the things that work for me May eighty eighty percent of it may work for you, and then that other twenty percent is entirely your own. Because um, I think there's all these listicles of like the ten things that Zadie Smith does to, you know, write her next bestseller, and I'm like, well, that only works for Zadie Smith. Um, and so just how it's it it really is just as particular as a thumbprint, you know. I love that you said that because um, uh, it came to me what I was going to say before, which was was voice. 
and which is kind of intangible, like just when you find, but when you know you found the voice that is right for the book, it just, you know it and, it, and it propels you. It lets you keep writing because you've, it's there. Um, but also room for idiosyncrasy and room for like for saying for for going against anything that anyone's ever told you ought to be in a book, mm -hmm. but feeling like um, you know you can make it your book. And and also I have to say the thing that that I, I um, uh, had to keep coming back to was uh, having a sense of playfulness, uh, a, a feeling of play uh, writing just. Um, it doesn't always feel like that, and when I lose it, I'm like, oh, I have to get back to that, and I have to let myself play more, and then the writing comes alive again. Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to get at, too. Like, I feel like we spend so much time just working on our craft, and then the book comes out, and it's like, what's the real-life story of why you wrote this? And you're like, but the craft, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think in writing courses, too, there's not enough emphasis put on, like, the publishing process, you know, because a lot mm. of people don't understand, or even submission process, too. I think a lot of people don't really get that from some courses, so I think those are all really great answers. Are there any more questions from the audience here? We have one online that I'll, I'll just mention quickly here. So um, someone is asking, in having your first book published, um, was it the experience you expected? I guess this is mostly for um, Christina and Miriam, although it can also be for Anne. You can go back in your memory. Have there been any surprises with the process? I guess I'll go because your book isn't out yet. <laughs> um, the, the biggest surprise to me, so I, I have been working on this book on and off various whatevers for 13 years. Um, and, you know, when you're around anything for that long, you hit a point when you're just like, please just go the F away. Like, just <laughs> exit my life forever, you know? Um, and, that, and it was such like a thing that I just so desperately wanted. I wanted the book gone. Like, I wanted it, I wanted it to belong to readers. And then once it did, I felt weird. Um, I felt a real, like, honestly, like a real crisis of identity um, because so much of defining myself as a writer was through the act of writing, but also the act of writing this book. And so all of a sudden, you know, it was in production, you know, sure, it was like, that's it, no more comma moving. And like, I couldn't touch it anymore. Um, and all of a sudden now, I had to be more expansive in my definition of myself as a writer, as not just like someone who you know was was writing and wrote autopsy, but like also will hopefully at some point be writing something else. Um, and so, and I I did not expect that. I thought I was just going to be happy skipping through the streets, you know, overfilled <laughs> with joy. But like I I got I was filled with like a weird sense of grief, mm. you know. Hmm. Yeah, I think... Um, so you have that to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, my book is not out yet, but it's almost out and people are reading it and, you know, there's, it's definitely out of my hands. Um, yeah, I think when I was writing my book, um, obviously I really wanted it to be published, but I was kind of not allowing myself to think about that. Uh, I just was like, okay, I'm writing a weird gay book with an unusual structure, and I'm going to like do honor to that in my soul, and even if no one likes it, then I'll have been true to my soul, you know? And then, and, but it just kind of changes your perspective when people are like, oh, we see what you did there, and we like it. And then you, I, like, for me, I just get in my head about it a little bit, and I'm like, I don't know, I guess I'm, you know, you have like the marketing stuff and you're, you're working on that and uh, you're summarizing and you're contextualizing. And now when I'm going to write, I'm like, oh no, I, I have this like marketing thing in my brain that I didn't used to have when I was writing my first book and I'm scared. I'm mm -hmm. scared of the second book. I think the, the first book I'm like, 
I did it. It's out, but what is it going to be like from now on? Yeah. Same. Yeah. I'd same. How about you, Anne? How, how was it after the first book? Um, I, I really don't remember in <laughs> that much detail. Like, uh, it was really, really exciting that it w that existed as a thing in the world. Like, that feeling of having the thing that was in your head and then that was, like, on a screen and then, you know, uh, be a thing you could lift up. Like, that was, that was a big, big thrill. And, I mean, I think I'd, we didn't have the social media back then. <laughs> and so there wasn't the same expectation about, um, um, about the marketing. Like, seriously, there was like, yeah, you're supposed to, you know, make yourself available. But there wasn't the, that level of pressure about it which you know i think was nice because i i didn't have those feelings mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that makes sense um we can take maybe one more question from the audience if there's one yeah uh, yeah what was the most uh, daring choice you made while writing each of your books uh, was there something that really scared you okay what was the most daring choice that you made when writing your books and was there something that really scared you Uh, sure. Okay. I mean, I think I, I think I made a lot of daring choices. Probably. <laughs> I mean, there's some cannibalism and some yeah. kind of <laughs> scatological parts. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> truly, but I think the most dar daring thing for me was uh, just to open up about mental illness in a way that was not. Uh, tongue in cheek. Um, I mean, I there there is some humor around it, but I did try to get to something real about it, and that was that was definitely in the final revisions, where I was like, okay, I have to be brave about this. Yeah, I really did love the cannibalism chapter. I have to say, <laughs> I was like, what? I kept reading. I was like, no way, no way, really. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I had a, a bunch of things, like I was, things I was worried about, but I don't know how daring they were exactly, like trying to find a way to deliver 17th century language in a way that's palatable to a contemporary ear. I adore 17th century uh, language, but honestly, like, you know, six people would read it. So um, I had to try to give the flavor to it. Um, and. And you know, like, is, is it is it? It's not daring to write a historical novel, I don't think. But in the way it, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, um, some of the things that, uh, like, to try to deal with a, a character who was born female and lives as a man in the past, um, without uh, and it kind of how to navigate that um, in a way just feels true to the characters and the time and that um, and I feel like I don't know how daring it was but it just felt like it need I, I needed to do it and I needed to let the characters be themselves and not impose anything upon them from our time and yet also I was interested in like how wrong people were about so many things in the 17th century and like kind of how um, we must be wrong about things too. We just don't know what they are. And I would say that it is daring to write a book that is like a queer historical fiction um, because so much of queerness is like youth coded, you know? So, oh, that's interesting. You know, and so, yeah, I, yeah. so I think it actually is to kind of like expand it and to also. Um, kind of like establish those histories, you know what I mean? It's not just like, and then one day there were gay people, like, you know, that they've <laughs> been there, you know, I think. That, for sure, that was a massive impetus. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I think that for me with Brautopsy, the thing that was the thing that was what I was most scared about um, in writing this book. Um, it wasn't so much like the depths of the various kind of familial grief, not even so much like the cultural reckoning and like the 
kind of violent friction between reckoning queer culture and Jamaican culture, it was to go back to what we were saying earlier, like the craft, it was the literal structure of the story. Um, because I was really concerned about the idea of trying to like um, approach each of these ideas each of these notions from perspectives that the reader had not encountered before and like the newness of that and then not giving them anything familiar that they could hold on to to carry them through. Um, the, um, my novel is not a typical linear narrative. It goes back and forth in time and my hope is that the juxtaposition between the back then and the right now gives the experience the depth and the richness and meaning to make this a satisfying experience overall. Um, but that's a risk, you know, like people are used to, they expect a linear narrative and when you um, eschew that, you kind of have to have a damn good reason um, and you also have to accept that then you're gonna lose some people. Even people who may be into like the subject matter or the like, or the idea of the story, just the, the means of presentation, you know, some folks may fall away. And then my hope is that the people who stay love this book as much as I do. Yeah, yeah I think that's great. So yeah, as, as you all mentioned, their books are very unique and they play with a lot with form and structure and they're just, I mean, in, in a queer novel, I mean, I think that's really brilliant. So I applaud all three of you. I really enjoyed reading your books. Um, maybe you just want to give us a quick little, um, a couple, maybe a sentence or so to let us know about any events you might have coming up or anything, you know, new that you might want to share, just a quick little thing before we have to wrap up. So let's start with Christina. Sure, so on May 2nd, 3rd, I'm looking at my editor because I can't remember the exact day. Um, I think it's May 3rd, I'm gonna be in Ottawa doing an event with the Ottawa Book Festival. Um, details are still being hammered out, but please do check out my website, christinajcook.com, or if you are social media minded, you will find me, I post way too much you will find me easily. Um, and as details become firmed up, I'll be posting them there. But that's my next Canadian event. Um, tomorrow night in Victoria, oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, um, I'm doing, uh, having a little book launch at Monroe's, um, awesome. which is exciting. And I have something coming up at, the, um, at Sydney, BC on June 2nd, and um, uh, Gibson's Public Library. Um, in the middle of June, I think it's the 19th. And I'll also be in Ottawa, but I think I'll be there a little bit after you're there. But oh, I'll be there man. on the Sunday. I don't know if you're still there. <laughs> no, so, I leave on uh, Saturday. Okay, we're gonna miss each other. Um, yeah, so I'm excited about the slate of books, book events to come up. Uh, well, my next big thing is gonna be my book launch, which you're all Woo! invited to. Woo! Um, it, truly, I think it's gonna be really fun. It's uh, on August 24 at the Bird House. I've recruited my two favorite oh. drag artists to play me and my ex. <laughs> oh my god, that's good. Do performances. So you um, must <laughs> please Instagram live this. I have to see <laughs> this. I must. It will be on social media and the, the details for attending will be on social media. It'll be free. Uh, yeah, my, my Instagram is Miriam on the outside. You can find me and I'll post all about it when, when I have stuff to post yeah amazing amazing thank you so much for sharing uh that and thank you so much to our writers tonight christina and miriam let's give them a big round of applause again awesome as well of course we want to give a big thank you to leslie at the writers festival and her Woo! team uh, and thank you for the opportunity to be up here and of course the Vancouver Public Library. Who can forget them? Thank you. And don't forget, uh, there will be signings of books, and uh, Gina's over there at the um, table, so please go over there and buy some books, and we'll see you at the signing buy table. Buy the book.